Developers, the wizards that shape your company like nobody else. Their code helps build your products, develop systems, and keeps your entire technology infrastructure from falling apart. But hiring the right developers is a tricky task. You receive a lot of applications, but you only want the best. So how do you identify the best developers without spending a lot of valuable time on the wrong candidates? Introducing Hacker Earth's technical recruitment software, a platform that helps you hire the best developers by using online tests to assess your applicants. Here's how it works. With Hacker Earth, you can invite candidates to remotely appear for customized coding tests for any technical role. And once they take your tests, you can access detailed performance reports to decide who makes it through to the next rounds. Auto-generate highly customized tests for any technical role, even if you're not a developer yourself. Access our library of more than 15,000 inbuilt questions or add and use your own. With over 35 programming languages supported, you can receive submissions in the language of your choice. The system magically evaluates the code submissions based on multiple parameters. And you get detailed reports on each candidate's performance. Copying or using any unfair means on a test is impossible thanks to our proctoring measures and plagiarism detection techniques. Hacker Earth helps you optimize your tech hiring process by scaling your hiring efforts, improving your accuracy, and reducing your time to hire. Tech recruiters use Hacker Earth for a variety of requirements, identifying the right candidates during lateral hiring, scaling their university recruitment efforts, and aiding workplace diversity through blind hiring. More than 500 companies globally use Hacker Earth to assess developers. Now, it's your turn to transform your hiring process. Register for a free trial today and try Hacker Earth now. So, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to today's Hacker Earth webinar. And today's topic is a very interesting topic. Uh, five recruiting strategies for hiring the best technology talent. A much talked about topic, uh, people, organizations looking for technology talent across the globe. Everyone wants the best developers. Everyone wants their software to stand out from others. So today's speaker we have with us, uh, Charlene Lobby. She's the president of the ITM group and also the author of the renowned blog, HR Bartender. So before carrying forward, I would like everyone to know a little bit about the platform that we're op optimizing on. So this platform is GoToWebinar and right below on the panel, we have a questions tab. So please make sure you ask your questions throughout the session. We'll make sure we address all your questions at the end of the session. Whenever you have a question, please feel free to go about and ask any questions that you have. Apart from that, can you all hear me and see the slides? I would love if some of you can maybe write a yes in the question section so I know that uh, we're working fine. Okay, I see a lot of yes is coming through, so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, before we move forward with today's uh, presentation by Charlene, I'd like uh, to introduce you guys to Hacker Earth and what we do as an organization. So back in 2011, Mark Anderson uh, very rightly said that the software is eating the world. Uh, be it any industry, be it the e-commerce, uh, software, uh, video, music companies, movie house productions, telecom industry, name it, you name the industry, and software is a major part. So in short, what he said in 2011 is actually turning out to be true, which is software is taking over the world. So this, these are some stats from a recruiter's desk uh, from sources as Talent Now and LinkedIn. Almost 56% of recruiters today state that the hardest part of recruitment is screening candidates while 76% of the hiring managers believe that attracting top talent is their biggest challenge, while 50% of recruiters and hiring managers believe that data will help them identify skill gaps in candidates for a job role. Well, technical recruitment is not that easy. I mean, it requires a lot of process. It's a lengthy process. Uh, a lot of candidates fall out due to the lengthiness of uh, hiring them. So I'll predominantly focus on two things while hiring, that is screening and interviewing. Both are very important. 
you want to screen the candidate based on his skills not on his resume maybe his resume might not be that interesting but he might have the skills for you to uh, make your company excel so the basic problem with screening is it's not scalable it's time consuming sometimes it happens to be inaccurate while interviewing is another big big challenge that recruiters face because they'll have to get the candidates to their office for these interviews and everything and it's also time consuming and the false uh, cost of false positive is also very high this is where we present hacker Earth. so we provide you with a developer assistant software that can help you hire the most talented developers across the globe uh, you don't have to worry about bad hires or losing potential anymore since our screening platform helps you spot the best from the talent pool that you have uh, thus enabling you to have the best software in the world we make it easier how do we do it so this is how we do it so create tests invite the candidates shortlist and interview so these create tests can be created using our own library we have a library of about 15k questions and you can add your own questions as well if you think that the questions you have the questions with yourself you can add those questions you can invite the candidates the platform using ai and machine learning algorithms which uh, judge the performance of a candidate and provide you with a report a very detailed report about which skills the candidate is good at and which skills does he lack in and similarly the interview part so we provide you with a remote interview software you can just click a button on the software and you can interview a candidate that is uh, sitting thousands of miles away from you and uh, you can check their coding skills using the interview platform so how do we do it we have a high quality of screening process so we automate and standardize the screening so that each candidate goes through the same process. We have a question library of 12K plus questions over 35 plus programming languages. So you can test them on any language that you want. You can keep an open question and you can ask them to code in a language of their choice as well. Uh, we have a 99.95% SLA uptime. We have had over 30,000 plus tests created over 1, 1 million plus candidates screened. We have a lot of integrations, five of them as of now, but we offer you 80 integrations if you want to have a particular ATS that you have, and we can integrate that with you as well. You can do global. Uh, we offer our platform in six languages apart from English, uh, which is uh, Russian, French, uh, Japanese, and a couple of more. So you don't have to worry about missing out on top talent because of their languages. So you can just set the language for the particular candidate as a language of their choice, and they can give the test. And lastly, remote interviews. Uh, you can create, you can have the remote interviews for your candidates sitting at their own homes and you can set up your offices and you can judge if they are the right candidates for your job or not we have had over a thousand plus customers worldwide amazon walmart lab nokia government of canada as well so a lot of big names there so we hope uh, to have you as well we would love to have your logo up in this slide as well so that's about hacker earth now we'll move on to today's presentation with charlene and uh, over to you charlene now Thank you, Arbaz, and thank you everyone for um, listening in today. Um, what we're going to spend the um, basically hour that we're together today talking about are three things. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the state of recruiting, and then we'll dive into five strategies that you could consider adding to your hiring process to recruit the best technology talent. And then finally, when you're thinking about those strategies to add to your hiring process, how you go about implementing those and measuring their success. So let's dive into our first topic, and that has to do with what's happening today in recruiting. Um, when we think about today's recruiting market, um, some of the things, um, or Buzz, if you want to move ahead to the next slide, some of the details that you might see when we're talking about today in recruiting has to do with the fact that job openings exceed job seekers. Now, I'm here in the United States, and you know, so the statistics that I'm pulling from are US statistics about the number of openings exceeding job seekers by like over a million. But I know that when I've been in India and Spain and the UK, I'm hearing the same conversation. It's hard to find great talent. Um, and that over the past few years, the market has definitely shifted to a candidate's market. The idea that when we 
promote a opening. Um, you know, we used to get hundreds and hundreds of resumes, and now we're lucky if we're getting a dozen. You know, I was talking with a recruiter the other day who said that they ran a posting for a position and they got zero applicant flow. Yes, zero applicant flow. Um, and part of the reason for this is, um, you know, if you just look at the demographic shift, um, older workers are exiting the workforce. Um, there's a Pew Research statistic that says 10,000 baby boomers a day are turning of retirement age. Now, granted, they're not all leaving the workforce at the same time, but they're thinking about it. And combine that with the number of young professionals entering the workforce, there are more people leaving than there are coming up um, you know, in the millennial ranks and the um, Gen Z ranks. So in that particular case, what we have is a situation where um, the supply uh, doesn't meet the demand. Specifically, when we talk about technology, though, there was an article in Tech Republic that said 67% of companies want to increase their headcount, but 41% say that they're having difficulties finding qualified candidates. You know, as our boss was talking a little bit about the Hacker Earth platform and some of the innovation that they're doing as a company, we know as business professionals that tech is driving organizational innovation. So finding the best tech talent is going to be a business necessity. So the question becomes, what are we going to do about it? You know, how do we find the best technology talent? And one of the things that we want to do um, moving on is move past the regular obvious conversation about we need to pay people more and we need to offer a competitive benefits package. You know, as human resources professionals, talent acquisition professionals, I know that you guys are out there surveying your market you know what the market can bear in terms of compensation and benefits packages. And you're having those conversations inside your companies. So are there other things that we can do to strengthen our hiring process and make sure that we're bringing the best tech talent in? Well, I've identified five things that we might want to start thinking about, um, and we're going to go through each one of these in a little bit more detail, but they involve reevaluating job requirements, incorporating a buy, build, and borrow strategy, going mobile, building a pipeline through internships, and adding a pre-board component. So let's go into the first one, and that is to reevaluate job requirements. Now, when I say reevaluate job requirements, I want to be really clear, and that is I'm not asking any organization to lower their standards. I think what we're talking about here in reevaluating job requirements is to reevaluate what the must haves need to be for a candidate to get considered. You know, Arbaz, this might be a great time for a poll question. Maybe we could. Um, Bring up the yes, poll. We'll, we'll put up the first poll question. And this poll and is, does is. your organization require a college degree for software developers? So you can respond with yes, and you are still getting plenty of qualified candidates. Um, yes, but maybe you're starting to have challenges finding qualified candidates. No. You're not requiring a college degree and you have plenty of qualified candidates. Or no, you really aren't focused on hiring software developers. Arbaz, what hacker earth position when it comes to um, college degrees right now? So we are very open about uh, hiring the right candidate rather than a person who has a lot on his resume. What we believe is if a person has the particular skill set that is required for the job, we don't look for their college degrees or anything like that. We are more focused on getting the job done, which is more important than, you know, seeing through fancy resumes, people having worked at multiple big organizations. But again, at the end of the day, what we're looking for is having that right person at the company at the right job. 
you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, when you think about what uh, a company is looking for, you know, what a hiring manager is looking for when they bring that candidate into the organization, the thing that they want to know and the reason that they select a candidate is they want somebody who's going to get the job done. And exactly. So how are we doing as far as the polls? Yes, so we have uh, the poll results. Uh, the f most answered question answer is uh, the second option, that is yes, and we are starting to have challenges finding qualified. Canada. Followed by the first option, that is yes, and we continue to have plenty of qualified candidates, while we've had an equal share for the last two options, that is no, and we are plenty finding of qualified candidates, and no, but we don't really hire software developers. You know, if, thank you everyone for answering the poll question. Um, Arbaz, if you don't mind moving, moving on to the um, next slide. One of the things that I thought was interesting, and this is a pretty new development, is that companies like Google, Apple, IBM, and others are no longer requiring college degrees. Um, you know, Arbaz, you talked about how it's the, the the key is, can you get the job done? And that a lot of other companies are saying the exact same thing. And that's not to say that the STEM skills, you know, when we talk about things like science, technology, engineering, and math aren't still important, they are. Um, but companies are kind of shifting their focus to KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, they're looking at the KSAs of their top performers and saying to themselves, do you know what kind of job requirements do we need to have for this particular position and the time to address this is often in that intake interview um, or that recruiting strategy interview when hr talent acquisition and the hiring manager are sitting down together and they're saying what kind of you know they're building the candidate persona they're talking about job requirements you know, what are the job requirements that we need to ask for? You know, looking at the job description and making sure that the job description is an accurate reflection of the work that needs to happen. What I'm seeing is this slight shift towards talking about trainability. Um, you know, if a candidate has um, a lot of the KSAs that the company is looking for, is that candidate trainable? Can we give the candidate all the tools that they need in order to be successful? And that kind of leads us to our second area, and that was to incorporate a buy, build, borrow strategy. You know, one of the things that we're having to learn in a challenging recruiting market is that every job is not a regular full-time opportunity. And when we're thinking about bringing people into the organization, you know, I talked about the, with item number one, I talked about having this conversation with hiring managers about requirements. One of the other conversations that we want to have with hiring managers is, is this a full-time job? And the buy, build, borrow strategy is an opportunity to engage in that conversation. So, for example, if you look at the first component, which is buy, the way you can incorporate a buy strategy into your organization, buy represents hiring talent from the outside. And the advantages to doing that are you can bring new skills into the organization, so, for example, those of you who were talking about um, requiring college degrees and still getting a tremendous amount of applicant flow, I can see this being a part of your buy strategy. You're bringing new skills into the organization. You might bringing, uh, be bringing some new perspectives into the organization that you definitely need. Part of the challenge, though, I don't have to tell anyone, is that when you hire people from the outside, it can cost a little bit more. You also have a cultural learning curve that new hires have to go through. 
Um, you know, they don't know the organizational culture. And as much as we want to say that we put our culture out there for everyone to see from an employment branding perspective, you know, on our applicant tracking systems and then all of our recruitment marketing, one of the other things that can happen here from a culture perspective is that there are these unwritten rules that, ha um, that pop up that a candidate is often not aware of when they come into the organization, they get hired. Part of that buy is new employees have a learning curve. Now, the second component to this buy, build, borrow strategy is the build piece. And this isn't going to surprise you. Build means developing talent from within the company. So if we're not able to go outside and find the talent that we're looking for, can we grow that talent inside the organization? And I think this is one of those conversations that even though we're going to rely on learning and development to you know, build a lot of our talent, this is something talent acquisition needs to be keenly aware of and have an opinion about. Because obviously the advantages to building include a boost to morale and that individuals will have that cultural knowledge that someone coming from the outside might not have. But the challenge is time. It takes longer to build talent within the organization than it does to bring some people in from the outside often. And we have to think about the bandwidth of the learning and development department. A couple of times in my career, we, um, the organizations that I've worked for wanted to build more talent from within, um, but they weren't prepared to bring on additional learning and development people. So this is where we went out and built partnerships with the community that were going to allow us to develop individuals, but not expand the learning and development department. And then finally, the third strategy has to do with borrow. And borrow involves bringing in freelancers and consultants to fill in those gaps. And there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, one, you can bring people in on an as needed basis. So let's say you have a special project that requires a special skill that you don't currently have within the organization. You can bring in that freelancer or contractor to perform that task and then that person goes away. But often when you're talking about bringing in freelancers or consultants, especially when you're talking about technology, one of the things that you could be looking at is a situation where you're looking for somebody to kind of come in once a week or once every couple of weeks or once a month to fulfill a role for the organization that you need that specialized knowledge and skills for. The challenge becomes um, making sure that those individuals are available when we want them to be available. So the great part about borrow is that we can go out there and hire individuals or engage with individuals and, you know, use them on an as needed basis. The challenge is making sure that they're available when we want them to be available. And the way we offset that availability piece is by keeping those contractors, freelancers, engaged with the organization. This involves a couple of different things when it comes to human resources, talent acquisition, and even the hiring managers that are going to be managing this kind of talent. You know, first of all, if you have any kind of purchasing procurement function, think about who brings in freelancer consulting talent to the company. And often in many cases, we were talking about situations where these freelancers or consultants might be hired because they had the lowest cost per hour. And when now when we're talking about using a borrow strategy, what we're talking about is making sure that this freelancer or consultant fills a talent need within the company. So it's possible that the person that fills the talent need isn't necessarily the person that costs the least amount of money from a you know, per hour standpoint. And this means that HR talent acquisition professionals are going to have to get involved in purchasing and procurement supply chain type issues. In addition to that, 
it means that we're going to want to train and have conversations with hiring managers about how we keep these freelancers engaged so that when we pick up the phone and call and say, hey, can you show up next Tuesday, that this person moves us to the top of the priority list. The third area to consider is about going mobile. And I wanna talk about going mobile from two standpoints. First of all, from the site standpoint, and then second of all, from a process. When it comes to going mobile on your career site, I thought that these statistics were really interesting and I apologize because the ones that I had immediate access to were all in the US. But my guess is, if we projected this globally, we would see similar statistics. And that is that a growing number of people own a cell phone and they, or they own a smartphone. And that a lot of people are now becoming what are called smartphone only users. And this means that the individuals we're talking about do not have a PC, they do not have a laptop, that what they're working with are mobile devices. And if we want those individuals to engage with us, then we need to make our career sites mobile responsive versus mobile friendly. And mobile friendly means that if you look at a, if you were looking at something on your phone that basically the desktop version of that site just gets you know shrinked down to the size of your mobile screen. So everything gets like really, really small and it becomes really hard to read versus mobile responsive. And that's where the desktop version gets reformatted to your mobile device. And the reason that we want to do this is because obviously, if people can read the site, then they're going to stay engaged, they're going to look for your jobs on the site, they're going to engage with your content. Um, if you have an opt-in on your career site to, for people to stay in touch with you, those are all things that they're going to do if they can easily navigate your career site using their mobile device. Now, once you engage with a candidate on your career site, then we have to think about the application process. And the idea here is that we want people to apply using their mobile devices versus what is probably considered to be a very old school method of, you know, I'm out and about, I get the word that there's this great job for a software developer on my phone. Now what I would have to do is think about, okay, I have to remember that there's this great job, I have to go home, get my resume together, and you know, email it or upload it to some sort of applicant tracking system. What we want people to do is go, that's a fantastic job, I'm going to apply for it right away using my mobile device. This means that candidates need to have the ability to quickly and easily apply for jobs on their phones. And what we wanna do is, as HR professionals, talent acquisition professionals, think about the gatekeepers. What do we absolutely need to know about a candidate in order to make the decision as to whether or not we want to talk to them? We can always go back and ask for, ask for applications and resumes at a different point in time, but what exactly is it that we need to know on the front end? I'm seeing a lot of companies that are starting to um, just say, send us the link to your LinkedIn profile as an opportunity just to get the basic information they need to decide whether or not they want to screen that candidate. The other thing that we want to do with our application process on mobile is give people the ability to share openings with their friends and family. So if I'm on my phone and I see an opening for a great software developer job, I want to be in a position to shoot that over to my friend or Bob and say, I was thinking of you because that keeps things out there on a regular basis. We should have an opt-in so that people can go into a talent pool, we can regularly communicate with them, and if people apply for a position, 
we want them to have the ability to do some sort of status check. I continuously hear that the number one complaint with recruiting processes is that applicants put information out, you know, they apply for a job and they never hear back from the company that they applied with. So we've got to figure out some way to give candidates the ability to know their application was received, it's being considered, because that keeps them engaged with the organization. And that allows us to build a pipeline. Now, one of the other ways that we can build a pipeline is through creating internships. Um, we can all, you know, we want to have the ability to stay in touch with the individuals that are coming to the organization. It's interesting, in this morning's news, I heard about something called midterm shifts. Um, and it's the idea that, you know, we have a tendency, I think, when we think about an internship to think of uh, students, you know, younger professionals. Um, but in this particular case, they were talking about individuals who have maybe been in the working world for you know a decade or more and now what they're doing is they're deciding that they want to change careers you know maybe have an encore career or a second career and they're going through this mid um, working life internship um, which i think is kind of interesting but the idea here is that when we bring interns into the organization not to just let them come and then leave so Arbaz, let's do another poll um, and find out um, about more about internship. Yes, so we'll launch the poll. And yes, there we go. Awesome. Quick question, does your organization have an internship program for student programmers? Um, so you can say, you know, yes, and it's a great way to build talent. Um, yes, but we're not turning interns into candidates. No, but you're considering one, and no, maybe maybe an internship doesn't align with your company culture. Okay, so, so just, um, yeah. Go just ahead, jump in. Here. I mean, we have a lot of people asking for the recordings will be sent to them or not. So just letting them know that we'll be sending out the recording as well as the slides to each one of you. So don't worry about that if you missed out on something due to some urgent meetings and everything. Uh, as per, yeah, so. Coming back to the poll question. Yes, how are we doing on the poll? Yes, yeah, so come on guys. Uh, we have seen almost 70% people voting. Let's be more engaged. Okay, so it's increasing now. So I just put forward my point of view from an Hacker Earth point of view. So we have a lot of internship programs for student programmers, be it a first year student or a fourth year student. And uh, we make sure that we give them the industry exposure that is very important for them to learn. Rather than uh, so students predominantly are thinking on the grounds of learning new things rather than earning more money when it comes to internships. So that's something that we keep in mind. And uh, we do, a, I mean, a decent job of offering a lot of internships to our students. I know of a company um, that does internships and they, they're a technology company here in the United States and they do internships and what they used to do is at the end of their internship program, you know, so they had people all over the company who were interns, they created this sort of like Olympic type game where the interns would compete with one another and it became something that all of the interns would look forward to every year. And it got to the point where it got to be so big and so much fun that the other tech companies in the area decided that they wanted to do it as well. So now the tech companies sort of have this competition where they call it the battle, they call it the battle of the interns. And it's for bragging rights, you know, that kind of thing. But what's, what's fun about it is that they're starting to invite former interns back to sort of, hey, you were an intern with us, come back and, you know, you can, you know, um, share in the networking portion. And so what this thing that has just turned into a fun way to end an internship has now become this huge 
networking recruiting event because the interns are now coming together and they're networking with each other, they're networking with the different tech companies in the area. So they've really turned it into something that's much, much more than just the internship. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we've come to the conclusion of the poll and we have about 50% of the people who said that yes, they have an internship program and it's a great way to build a pipeline of talent. Second, we have uh, people 29% who say no, but they're considering one, followed by the last option that's no, it's, it really doesn't align with our culture, that is 14%, while the rest 5% say that yes, but we're not turning interns into candidates. Okay, well, it's good to know that the majority of people who are doing internships are seeing some benefit from that type of internship program. Um, if you look at some of the things that you might want to consider doing if you are going to build a pipeline through internships, have a conversation inside your company. Build some consensus inside your company about what an internship program is going to look like. You know, how are you going to create meaningful work for your interns? And confront the pay issue. Uh, you know, internships, in some places, internships are considered unpaid positions, and in some places, they are considered pay positions. Confront the pay issue and reach some consensus as an organization about the kind of experience that you're going to provide to interns. Give people the tools in order to be successful. Not only do you want to give interns some tools that they can take with them as part of their internship, but spend some time with the management team sharing with them how they can successfully manage interns in the organization, how they can give them knowledge, how they can coach them, you know, those kinds of things. Because if interns have a very positive experience, then they're going to want to come back and they're going to want to work for the organization. And then finally, have that feedback mechanism in place so that when an intern completes their time with you, you have some sense of how the program is working and you can constantly go back and make your program stronger on a regular basis. The final area to consider, and this kind of moves us maybe a little bit out side of the hiring process, but it's about adding a pre-boarding component. And what I mean by pre-boarding is there's this period in time after a candidate receives the job offer and they accept before they start to work. Some people might call it a silent period. But when I think of onboarding, I like to think of it like an umbrella. And so the pre-boarding component is this period in time between the person's accepted the offer, but they haven't started on day one. And you have individuals in this period in time where sometimes the company doesn't do a great job of communicating with them. And what ends up happening is a concept called ghosting and or that the candidate just doesn't show up on the first day of work. Um, we can mitigate some of that by creating some conversations during the pre-boarding phase. And some of the things that we can do, there are actually three things that we might want to consider doing in adding a pre-boarding component, is think about that welcome. If you have a dispersed workforce, maybe get the CEO to record a welcome video that you can send to candidates to let them know that, you know, we're excited to have them join the team. The hiring manager or maybe other people on the team that the candidate met along the way, this is a great opportunity to say we're looking forward to having you work with us. If your organization does a buddy program, a new hire buddy program, they're very popular, um, the, the buddy program can inter be introduced. This is what a buddy is going to do. Um, you can introduce that person to their buddy via email, maybe via a, a video chat of some sort, but this gives the person another sense that there are people there who are going to help them be successful. And then finally, you can send some FAQs. You can talk about what's going to happen on the first day, what to wear, where to park, don't bring lunch, we're going to take you out, this is what, you know, this is what the coffee maker does, 
you know, those kinds of things, because those are all the kinds of questions that an employee, a new employee has. And once those questions get answered, then employees can focus on the work. And that gets back to the first point that we were really trying to make during our time together. And that is we hire people because we want them to get the job done. And so anything that we can do to have a good handoff between talent acquisition and whoever's responsible for the onboarding component in your organization, learning and development, human resources, but whoever's responsible for that, making that good transition is essential to keeping people once they get hired. Now, I have to admit, I was putting together this list, and after we, um, after our boss and I talked about the five elements, we came up with number six. So there's a bonus here, and this bonus one uh, is about cultivating partnerships with colleges and universities. I know that in today's labor market, a lot of people are thinking, we want to go out to colleges and universities, and we want to let graduates know about our opportunities, but just showing up at a job fair isn't enough. If you want to cultivate the partnership, it's now about building a strategic alliance. You know, have staff and students visit your offices. Let them see what your work environment is like. And conversely, we as HR people have to learn more about the college or the university. Um, maybe we offer to be a guest speaker, talk about the business environment. It might be an opportunity. I know I've gone to my alma mater a few times and done things like mock interviews or talked about, you know, recruiting, you know, what job seekers need to look for. So sort of sharing some experience there. Your company might even want to host the student event to get people more interested in your organization. But cultivating those partnerships with colleges and universities can yield you some results as well. So the six things that we talked about today include reevaluating job requirements, incorporating that buy, build, borrow strategy, going mobile, not only on your applicant tracking system, but in your processes, building that pipeline through internships, adding a pre-boarding component, and then building a strategic alliance with universities and colleges. But once we do these things, you know, once we put one of these strategies into place or we identify a strategy that we want to add to the organization, then we have to figure out how to implement it. Now, I have to admit from my standpoint, I am a big fan of SMART, the acronym SMART. I like to use this as a way to set goals and execute goals. And I will say that I, I treat one of the, the letters a little bit different, the, the R, but let's walk through it together. When we talk about specific, we're saying here, what's the goal? And maybe you saw something today that you would like to do. Like, for example, I'd like to add a mobile component to our, our applicant tracking system. And then measurable becomes how will we recognize success? How will we know when we've achieved the goal? Attainable are outlines the steps, the individual steps that it takes to achieve the goal. And responsible is about who will be responsible for each step. And, you know, even when you're doing this on a small scale, so let's say, for example, you're doing this for something that you want to add to the hiring process as a talent acquisition professional, you might find that it's not all of you. You know, you're going to have to reach out there, grab some key stakeholders, get some buy-in around the organization. And then finally, to attach a, a time component to it. What's the deadline? And this doesn't mean that these things can't be changed along the way, but I found that if I do this for each goal, you can put this on a board in front of you all the time, and it allows you to stay very, very focused on the, what you're trying to accomplish. And then once you implement it, 
you can decide the best way to measure your results. Now, I happen to believe that we have to measure things both quantitatively as well as qualitatively. On the quantitative side, we can use things like time to fill. You know, if we're talking about building partnerships with colleges and universities or some of the other things that we talked about today, maybe those things will simply reduce our time to fill, and that's a good metric that the organization embraces. You can also look at things like cost per hire. Um, you know, all the costs that are associated with bringing a candidate and the, an employee into the organization. But that cost for hire will go down. And then finally, I also like the concept of yield ratios, and especially if you do any kind of high volume recruiting. But yield ratios are the idea that we look at each step in the hiring process and we look at the ratio between steps. So you can take a recruiting funnel, and you know, if at the top of the funnel it's how many applications you received, and at the bottom of the funnel it's how many people um, finished new hire training, you can then from a high volume recruiting perspective, figure out how many applications you need in order to get a graduating class through training. And this is a great way to look at the process, keep on top of how many uh, interviews you need to conduct, how many offers you need to extend, and you don't necessarily have to second guess. From a qualitative standpoint, we can do post-recruiting surveys. Um, I've always worked for companies that when you got hired after you went through orientation, we told you that you were going to get an anonymous survey from us that said, we asked you to critique the recruiting process. It wasn't, it wasn't about who said what, it was about making sure that our recruiting process was strong. We also did onboarding check-ins, and this a lot of times is coming up again in terms of something called a pulse survey, and this is going out to new hires at certain points and just saying, how are things going? Is everything going as anticipated? And if there are some little things that we need to address, that they can be addressed along the way. And then finally, talking about stay interviews. And I don't know that organizations are doing this nearly enough, and that is going to employees and asking them, why do you stay with the company? And this it serves two purposes. One, if you know why people stay with the company, then gosh, you don't want to get rid of the things that employees think are really valuable, and they say that are part of the reason that they stay. But the second thing is, if you know why employees stay with the company, then take that list, stick it on your applicant tracking system, your career portal, and say, this is what our employees say is so great about the company. It is instant branding for your organization. I know we've talked about a lot of things today, but here are a few takeaways um, to keep in mind. First of all, the current job market isn't going to significantly change anytime in the near future. The demographics simply say that more people are leaving the workforce than entering. Organizations have to have strategies, and that includes talent acquisition strategies. So make the plan and work it, and as you measure the results, you can make some adjustments accordingly. And on that note, our boss let's do my favorite part of these kinds of webinars, and that is open it up for some questions and answers. Okay, so guys, you can keep in your questions coming and we have a lot of questions, but I'll just take like two minutes to put on the bonus strategy that we gave out, which was to cultivate partnerships with colleges and universities. So that is something that we at Hacker Earth help you with so we have a pool of universities that we have a tie-up with in the us in india across the world it's not just about these two countries but uh, we have a tie-up with a lot of universities across the globe and we can help you in um, finding the right talent for your organizations either through hackathons which is a very good way of judging a person's skills or through assessments that we usually offer so, okay, so let's move on to the questions now. We have a lot of questions coming in. So the first question is, okay. So 
it is about the initial slides that we have about not having a degree and season asks us that not requiring a degree presents a problem for immigration how are companies according to you handling that i'm let me answer your question by saying i am not an immigration attorney and so i don't pretend to be one and my suggestion to you would be to reach out and find an immigration professional that can address that answer. So uh, immigration law is, is very, very tricky. And on top of that, it, it is constantly changing. So I know that there are resources through the Society for Human Resource Management. Um, I think it's called the Council for Global Immigration. Um, I think it's called the Council for Global Immigration. Um, and they have some resources there through SHRM and, and I'm sure through SHRM India, if you're, if you're located in India. Um, but um, I'm going to have to defer that to the um, legal experts. Okay, awesome. So, so we're launching a poll about uh, Hacker Earth, if you're interested in Hacker Earth. In the meantime, we'll carry on with the questions. You can answer the poll if you're interested in a demo about our developer assistance software and also about hackathons. Moving on to the next question, we have a question. A lot of, a lot of people are asking about how do you actually attract the right talent for your organization? One of the things that, and we didn't talk about it today, but developing a, an employer brand is so important so that when people think about your company they think not only about your product or service that you provide to consumers but they think about how you how you operate as an employer you know you're hearing in the global news about companies that do an excellent job of taking care of their employees and you also equally hear about companies that aren't doing an excellent job of taking care of their employees. So I think that the organization has to think about what do you want your reputation to be as an employer and work on putting that package together and making sure that people understand it. If you, and then let me, let me kind of say, that doesn't mean that you have to offer the highest pay and the biggest benefit but look at who you are as a company and, and what you want to get across. I mean, I'll give you an example. I used to work in the hospitality industry and the hospitality industry is not known for paying the highest wages, but people who work in hospitality love to travel. So we would always, you know, make sure that when we were out there and promoting our employer brand, that we were talking about if you love traveling, this could be a terrific job for you. I mean, now the offset is you're not going to make a lot of money, but you are going to get to travel. And so you can attract the people that you're that will align with your brand that way. Awesome. That I guess that answers the question. Uh, moving on to the next question from Annie. She asks us, uh, do you have any advice for small companies to compete for talent with larger organizations? Highlight what makes you fantastic. There are lots of people out there who want to work for small companies. And so I would, I would say if you are at a small company, don't think of it as a disadvantage. There's a definite advantage and take advantage, leverage that advantage that you have as a small company. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, individuals who work for small companies, they, they are not bogged down with bureaucracy that sometimes you associate with larger organization. They can, uh, they can expand their role quickly. They can get involved in projects that they would not typically be involved in. So think about what makes your company special as a small organization and highlight those things because there will be people out there who are like, this is exactly the kind of company I want to work for. Awesome. So moving on to the next question, we have a question from Okay, so a lot of people are asking the same question, so I'll club them up. 
So it's about how, what is your take on how these things apply to clearance recruiting? What kind of recruiting? I'm sorry? Clearance recruiting. Even I'm not aware of that. So maybe if uh, someone could share a little bit clearance. Is that for like security jobs? Uh, yes, I guess that's what they mean. Yes, for security, security clearances. Clearance recruiting. Clearance recruiting, my understanding of clearance recruiting, and I want to make sure. So it's a, by clearance, I guess uh, it means like secret, secret, top secret, or state departments or governments, if they want to hire for tech talent, how do they keep a check on this, on all the processes that were involved? I will say that clearance recruiting, as far as I know, is a very um, well defined, structured process. So I'm not sure that I completely understand what the question is. I mean, there's a process already in place. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the next question. And that is, uh, when we talk about not seeing the degree of any candidate, do we mean to say that we should not look at their resumes at all and just hire them based on their skills? When we talk about um, the degree requirement, first of all, I would, just like any other time that you make a major change to your hiring process, um, you're going to want to run that through your entire organization and get buy-in. Uh, you know, so for example, um, if you decide all of a sudden that you're going to add an assessment or something like that, you're going to want to make sure um, that, you know, for example, you talk with legal and risk and, you know, everything like that. Um, I would do the same thing here if I were considering adding a degree requirement or removing a degree requirement to make sure that it's defensible. Okay, awesome. So I guess that answers your question, Vijay. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, so people are asking, how do you create a partnership with colleges and universities? Are there any hacks or tips that you would like to share on that? couple of things to consider. Um, get to know professors, get to know um, uh, career advisory staff, uh, and spend time with them. You know, ask them questions, find out, you know, do some probing uh, to understand, you know, what they're looking for in a partner. Uh, you know, those are going to be the most fruitful, the most beneficial relationships that you have. And find out, you know, if you have regular talent acquisition meetings, HR related meetings where professionals get together and they talk about issues, find out if those college and university representatives are going to those meetings. So it's possible that you can meet them in a professional networking standpoint on a regular basis, or maybe they're conducting events on site, you know, like at the college and business or something like that, where you can go over there and you can regularly network with the university. Awesome. Okay. So we also, as, as a part of our services that we offer to organizations, we have a campus program that runs across the US and India as well. So if you're looking to hire college students, uh, looking to have a tie up with certain universities, then you can contact us as well. So moving on to the next question. Uh, so Holly asks us, uh, why do you think that there is less younger people coming into the job market? Because the birth rates for younger people are less. So if you, sit, if you just look if you just look demographically at the numbers, um, there are the birth rates are lower, um, which means that there are going to be less people entering the job market. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, it's about how do you reach out to talent pools? I mean, what are the best ways to reach out to talent pools? It's basically about uh, what are the different kinds of mediums or sources through which people can reach out to, let's say, in-demand tech talent. So what is your take on that? 
there's a couple of ways that you can do it. Uh, first of all, I know a lot of organizations that create newsletters and what they do is they create a newsletter maybe around an aspect of being a job seeker that will be attractive to someone or the industry. And at the bottom of that electronic newsletter, they say, are you aware of these openings? I know talent acquisition professionals that write blog posts for their company blog about common job seeker related information like you know how to ace your next online interview or something like that and at the bottom of it they just put ways for people to stay engaged with the organization uh, creating a facebook page uh, for their careers or creating a twitter account for careers um, another thing is instagram is tremendously popular as a way to take pictures of your work environment and constantly keep that out there so that people can see what your work environment is like. But it's going out there and finding ways to keep people engaged with your content so that when you do have openings that you can say, and hey, by the way, we're hiring developers right now, so um, go and apply. Awesome. So that's predominantly about it, I guess. So you can also reach out to multiple social media sites, maybe LinkedIn. A lot of job seekers are on LinkedIn as well, while there are other websites that offer you a talent pool as well. So moving on to the next question. Uh, so this is okay. So this is about hiring a lot of people in a very short span of time. So I guess this is somewhere around, let's say, let's take an example of a company wants to hire, let's say, 100 people in a month. So how do you suggest a recruiter to go about the same? First of all, figure out where you're sourcing 100 people. I mean, you know, this gets back to when you think about a recruiting yield. If you need to hire 100 people, how many applications do you need to get? And where strategically are you going to go and get that applicant flow? And that's going to drive some of that conversation. You know, are you going to get it from colleges and universities? Are you going to put on an event like a hackathon? Uh, you know, what are you going to do in order to generate the applicant flow that you need in order to hire 100 people? And, and you have to back, I, I like backing into that strategy because that's going to tell me where to go and how to set up a process that will yield me the result that I'm looking for. Oh, okay, that's awesome. So a lot of questions on recruiting efforts, as in how do you measure these recruiting efforts that you're putting into while hiring? Think about, go to your senior management team. If, if you're not calculating any numbers right now with regard to recruiting, go to your senior management team and find out what they want to see. There's no sense in calculating a number that people are not prepared to make decisions about. A lot of times, you know, the most common ones that I think of are things like cost for hire and time to fill, those kinds of metrics. Once you start calculating those kinds of metrics, then you can use those to have conversations within the organization about if we do this to our hiring process, it could reduce time to fill. If we do this to our recruiting process, it will reduce cost per hire. You know, for the per people who were asking about high volume recruiting, this is where you can take those numbers and go back to the organization and say, if we do this, it will have a positive impact on the recruiting process and the company will be prepared to make decisions about it. So go to the organization and say, if I, you know, were to give you some numbers, which ones would you respond to? Okay, so I guess we're running out of time and we're having a few more questions. So I'll try to club them up as much as I can. Okay, a question about pre-boarding. I guess we missed out on that particular thing. Uh, what exactly can you elaborate a little bit about pre-boarding and its effect of getting the candidate on board? Pre-boarding pre does a couple of things. One, it keeps you in touch with the candidate before they start, so you don't run the risk of losing them. The second thing that pre-boarding does is it provides the candidate with some information that could be very helpful prior to their first day. So that if you, you know, a lot of times when we think of the traditional new hire process, on day one, candidates go to orientation or something like this. 
instead of that candidate coming in with nothing, uh, this gives them the opportunity to have some information ahead of time. Uh, companies will often, you know, just share basic questions. They'll talk about what processes look like. Um, but this just gives the candidate some sense of comfort that all of their questions are going to be answered. And it really allows them to focus on the work, you know, versus all of the other things that are happening when you become a new employee. I know some companies will send paperwork, new hire paperwork to an employee ahead of time and ask them to complete some paperwork and have it ready on their first day of work so that they don't spend their first day of work just filling out forms. Yep. So I guess we are short on time now and I guess if you address all the possible questions, I've tried to club them all. And yes, so yep. So I guess we'll close the session for now and the questions that are left and still coming in, we'll try to uh, send these questions to Charlene and she can answer us and we can send them to you via emails. So thank you so much, Charlene, once again for taking out time out of your busy schedule to be a part of today's webinar session. And we are uh, deeply Thank honored to have me. such a esteemed person from the HR community as a speaker for our webinar series. Also, uh, I'd like to, me. yep, we are delighted. And uh, thank you to all the attendees uh, across the globe. We see a lot of people from different time zones as our attendees and really thankful to you guys for making it to the session. Uh, we'll be having more such sessions in the future and we'll make sure that you be invited for them as well. So we we'll close off now. Thank you so much, Charlene. Thank you so much to all the attendees today. I uh, hope you have a good day ahead, good night ahead, and bye-bye. Developers, the wizards that shape your company like nobody else. Their code helps build your products, develop systems, and keeps your entire technology infrastructure from falling apart. But hiring the right developers is a tricky task. You receive a lot of applications, but you only want the best. So how do you identify the best developers without spending a lot of valuable time on the wrong candidates? Introducing Hacker Earth's technical recruitment software, a platform that helps you hire the best developers by using online tests to assess your applicants. Here's how it works. With Hacker Earth, you can invite candidates to remotely appear for customized coding tests for any technical role. And once they take your tests, you can access detailed performance reports to decide who makes it through to the next rounds. Auto-generate highly customized tests for any technical role, even if you're not a developer yourself. Access our library of more than 15,000 inbuilt questions or add and use your own. With over 35 programming languages supported, you can receive submissions in the language of your choice. The system magically evaluates the code submissions based on multiple parameters. And you get detailed reports on each candidate's performance. Copying or using any unfair means on a test is impossible, thanks to our proctoring measures and plagiarism detection techniques. Hacker Earth helps you optimize your tech hiring process by scaling your hiring efforts, improving your accuracy, and reducing your time to hire. Tech recruiters use Hacker Earth for a variety of requirements, identifying the right candidates during lateral hiring, scaling their university recruitment efforts, and aiding workplace diversity through blind hiring. More than 500 companies globally use Hacker Earth to assess developers. Now, it's your turn to transform your hiring process. Register for a free trial today and try Hacker Earth now.